morning, everyone. It's very nice to, um, to be here. I'm going to talk just a little bit about the historical and the social aspects of, um, of, of leather. Um, and um, I'll be hurrying through my uh, um, slides a bit so that I don't interfere too much with the, both the time and the depth and integrity of what some of the other speakers will talk about. It's hard not to delve into the subject, but I want to leave that free. But I think you all will get a copy of the slides. If you don't, certainly feel free to get hold of me and uh, I'll send them to you so that you, if there's anything I skip by, um, you'll easily uh, be able to uh, catch up. Um, that was fascinating from sort of my perspective because to talk about it, you don't normally need to bring lots of samples along because most people that you're talking to will have one, two, or three items with them um, that contain leather, you know, shoes, a wallet, purse, a belt, um, a handbag, or a briefcase. Um, and even today, in a very changing uh, social atmosphere, uh, we still normally have one or two pieces uh, of leather uh, uh, with us uh, when we go about our daily lives. Uh, go back in time, and that increased, go back a long way in time, and you start to recognize that uh, there was a time when there was a very little other material that society had um, if it didn't have caves and trees for shelter, um, if it didn't have uh, wood from canoes for boats. Uh, suddenly, the only sizable pieces of material uh, that uh, people uh, had were hides and skins. Um, and even if you come a lot forward to the founding time of New York. Why is New York here? New York began as a trading place for hides and skins, uh, being shipped uh, mostly to Europe but all over the world uh, from here. Um, and uh, being here in New York for someone like me is pretty fascinating um, because um, not only was it when it began a big trading place, very soon became a very significant manufacturing place, um, and in um, and in 1650, by 1650, the tanners here had been asked to move over what is now Wall Street and start their industry only in the area which became uh, famously named the Swamp it was basically a series of ponds at that time outside the city between Wall Street and what is now Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and that is a really famous part of the leather world. You just heard Steve talking about uh, vegetable tanning and the new mineral tanning with uh, Romeo. The big meeting that decided that huge change for the leather industry took place in a restaurant called Ratty's Restaurant in Frankfurt Street um, uh, in about 1880, with Brooklyn Bridge being built at that time, just on the edge of Frankfurt Street, uh, three years off opening. And in that famous, famous Anning Street, one man from the corset industry, both German immigrants, one was from the corset industry, an accountant, the other was from the dye stuff uh, in industry. The chap from the corset industry was in charge of the Booth Group's activities in the United States and was uh, also <coughs> heading up a tannery in upstate New York in Gloversville. And what they wanted as they sat with all the other tanners having lunch in Frankfurt Street, was how to make a bit of leather that was a bit waterproof, that you could cover the metal pieces in ladies' corsets, 
so that when uh, there was a bit of perspiration there, the leather didn't go black from the metal getting wet and uh, stay in the corset. And three years later, out came Mr. Schultz with a couple of patents which started the process of chrome to chrome tanning. Not the method we use now, but definitely the first significant moment when we had our chrome tanning. Just the other side of the city, uh, in Frankfurt Street and all the, all the streets uh, um, um, around. And that is just the fabulous excitement and involvement you have as you you come to a place like New York where leather has always been important from the very beginning and remains important um, um, today. And leather has evolved with the history. But nowadays, it's very much evolved around two words I think you can use. And one is functionality, the performance attributes of the elder of leather, and the other is beauty, beauty and elegance how it looks, because the very big change in the leather industry from those times to now is that the consumer now has choices about buying leather or not buying leather. There are no areas today where there are not competitive materials for the consumer to choose, whereas in history there were very limited options for consumers. Nowadays, that's not true. Society is changing, technology is advancing, and manufacturers and consumers can offer us leather or can choose to go for something cheaper or different for whatever um, reason. Uh, and leather wins on function um, and in all the different multitude of end uses um, that it can be put into. Leather is a kind of contemporary on the one hand and a heritage material on the other and it performs multiple roles um, and it does help the <coughs> consumer uh, um, with being able to express um, their identity. And it has this fabulous capability of being different things in different contexts and for different people. And it reaches far beyond just the beautiful and the functional into, in some way, being um, symbolic. And that relates in many ways to the fact that in our modern society, Certainly the wealthier parts of our modern society, most of our needs are satisfied. So the old format of buying things uh, by the classic five-stage process of, of identifying need and going out and search, searching and comparing the various options and making the purchase, that's only used in a tiny, tiny proportion of our Purchases. Classical theory is really pretty much ir ir irrelevant because um, nearly all our needs are well satisfied and we're not buying products um, because we need them. It's more for one reason or other because we like them and even more because the products that we think somehow or other uh, are helping us say something about who we are. Um, and that is a very big change uh, from the... Oh, that, um, from, who, from, who, from who we are, we are. And it does mean that you can build up these leather narratives of how people see leather and why they like leather. And it's very much a 20th, 21st century thing since 
almost every single end use of leather uh, became available to be replaced by other materials and we're looking at consumer choice. We have to try and understand what relationship does leather have with the modern consumer. And often you see these words coming up in discussions about taste, about it uh, being a sign of a tough guy, or a sign of seduction. Such different, widely apart uh, um, expressions, sophisticated, authentic, classy, um, um, rebels in search of adventure, um, luxurious and graphic and, and glamorous, uh, material for uh, all seasons, um, innovative and a feel-good factor in its many uses. And these are important words for us as tanners to understand and uh, to get to, uh, to grips with. Uh, the concept that we just make leather as we've always made it in the past and consumable by it is a historical uh, 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 era. In the past, yes, we uh, used to make uh, parchment for uh, writing on, and then paper was introduced. So those making parchment uh, knew that they'd better get on and make something, uh, uh, and make something uh, else. And what those something else were was pretty obvious. In the 21st century, it's not so clear. Uh, it's much more difficult uh, to really know, uh, as a tanner, how you are going to move your material forward to keep it relevant in the modern society. And the leather, our raw material, is very good at evolving to fit with contemporary society. We have to, as tanners, have to move it along through our understanding of what consumer expe expectations are. Um, leather itself, as a material, is precise. It, it's not an umbrella uh, term leather like textile. Textiles can be plant-based, textiles can be animal-based like wool, um, they can be uh, oil-based like, uh, uh, like poly, poly, polyester. Um, um, plastics uh, is a huge umbrella for different types of PUs and PVCs and different types of material. Leather, sorry we're stuck. Leather is the hide and skin of an animal essentially intact. And we've been pretty strict on that definition since about the 16th century, when it went into various acts of uh, parliament. The diversity you get within that, of course, is pretty great, just as Steve explained the different animals out of which you would make leather. And you can get the, the, the wide diversity of leather pipes. Uh, that come from different animal types and different processing types. But it's a very distinct uh, origin that we are, uh, are working with. And the one thing that's absolutely true about that leather, which does give this complexity, which I'm trying to uh, uh, convey, seems to be hugely important, but not well understood, is the fact that for all we make an engineered product today, for all we make a product very carefully uh, processed um, um, to be of extremely high quality. Um, we're not um, uh, synthesizing anything. What we are doing in manufacturing terms is a conditioning process. So we are mildly changing our raw material to make it slightly better for the end uses um, to which it's going. And so we are starting with a complex collagen matrix that has a fantastic level of capabilities and strength. And we are ending with a complex collagen matrix um, whose strengths and capabilities and beauties we are uh, allowing it to maintain and keep for longer. And somehow that essential collagen natural nature uh, makes it um, a material that plays to our humanity 
it's biophilic, um, it um, fits well in making us more comfortable in city life, it seems to be why we like to cover our gadgets with leather, because it humanizes the world of technology, of steel, of glass, and of city life, of, um, of um, city life. Um, we like to handle it, we like to touch it, we like to smell it, we like to, um, to, to, to work with it. Um, um, we um, love to, um, uh, to handle it, to look at it, uh, to hold it, uh, to, to wear it. Um, we love its durability. Um, there's a trust and honesty that comes with that durability. As Lisa said at the beginning, from many, many articles, that they grow better as they grow old. They don't wear out. Leather very rarely wears out. The threads might go, a zip might go, but it's very rare for leather itself to wear out. The articles be well designed. Thread should be repairable and the zip shouldn't be stuck too far inside that you can't easily access it, uh, access it and, um, and, and repair it. Um, integrity comes into this equation. Leather's not some throwaway Leather is entirely uh, 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 different. And longevity means um, that you are throwing less stuff away and it means that you're needing to go up out and dig up or mine or quarry uh, new materials far less. Um, this is a really uh, big um, uh, uh, thing to be thinking about in this awful modern uh, disposable uh, in, in, in world. Think of things like um, airplanes. Um, I flew up um, in the UK just last week and I was looking at the third last little row of seats as we went out the back door and the cushions were missing from a lot of the seats. And apparently what had happened was somebody had spilled the coffee in their coffee. And of course on a textile seat they had to take the cushions out, leave them at base to get them dried out. If it were leather what do you do? You wipe it down with a damp cloth. Off you go. Um, low maintenance, longevity. The seats, I've probably heard I'm a little bit Scottish and um, we fly a lot on, a, on British Airways, although I'm not sure how British it is anymore. Um, their short uh, haul airplanes have just replaced their leather seats. They were supposed to last for eight years, but actually they replaced them after 12 years. Um, now, if they had textile, they replaced those between three and five years. And of course, if you buy textile seats for an aeroplane, you have to buy 50% more. Why do you buy 50% more? Because every six months, you have to take the covers out and have them dry clean. After you have them dry clean, you've got to read fireproof them and put them back in a huge environmental load every six months washing, uh, dry cleaning, uh, um, uh, fireproofing. Twelve years. Well, what do you do with your old leather? Wipe it down with a damp cloth. What do you do if somebody spills something over it? Wipe it down with a damp cloth and carry on. Textile seat. You know, stuff that seat can't be used until you can get it out properly clean and, uh, and, and dry. This is significant. So we have a wee hall in London, uh, the worshipful company of, of leather sellers, kind of a gra grand uh, thing. Um, that wall in there, that's their latest hall. They've sitting in, I think, 650 years. And they're hoping that hall will last 200 years. And the one thing we know is that all of that wall, which is made of, um, of leather, that'll be there in 200 years. And what maintenance will it have had in that 200 years? A duster, maybe? Nothing more. Uh, 
Lemon is just a fantastic, uh, a fantastic uh, uh, material. And of course, I came up down from Grand Central this morning, and there are two areas at Grand Central uh, where people will polish um, your shoes for you. But I'm of that generation that likes seeing it as a as a weekend uh, as a weekend a weekend job. But if you can keep your shoes an extra year or two, and not just buy them for a season, um, and then throw them out, you're beginning to see the fantastic value of leather in this planetary battle that we are having uh, with uh, um, uh, loss of resources and wasteful uh, use of, uh, of resources. In um, scientific term, we're talking about Product life extension. Product life extension is the first stage of the circular economy. The circular economy was really invented by uh, Professor Steyer, very elderly uh, Swiss gentleman now, but his product life in, uh, um, institution um, um, is, is still survives uh, and is still being run. Um, and he's just updated and republished lot of his material. And what you're basically saying, if you want to uh, get at 70% of the benefits of what we call the circular economy, you do it with a couple of loop extensions at the beginning, which we tend to forget about. And the first is for using things longer by looking after them. Nothing could be better than buying your shoes and keeping them a bit longer, buying your clothes and keeping them a bit longer. And a little bit of maintenance is really wonderful uh, in, uh, in, in doing that. The next loop is to repair them and get them repaired. Um, and so the one thing I did notice in the swamp when I was over uh, on Sunday uh, seeing uh, the origins of New York's leather industry. Other than street signs, there's no sign that it was a big leather uh, district, it's rather sad. But I did find a little Chinese co cobbler there, uh, ready to repair your shoes. And these are the sort of people we need to encourage. And what Stahel said is if across the board, not just leather things, but electronic goods and other other <coughs> things, if we went to a repair type of economy, we should be employing 4% of our workforce. 4% of our workforce and jobs that will never be taken away by uh, um, artificial in, in intelligence. Um, this is big numbers. But this is an area in which leather has a perfect natural fit. It's not for fast fashion. It's, it's not for rapid disposal. Um, it's for value. It's for longevity. Uh, it's for, um, it's for um, uh, high quality. Um, and as our chairman said at the beginning, making of leather is both an art and a science. I think today, with the demands that we make on products, it is fair to say that the modern tanners that most uh, of us uh, work in now uh, make highly engineered products. And the new Italian machinery that we were hearing about from one of our sponsors early on has really begun to make huge strides in the last uh, uh, 15 to 20 uh, decades. They're not just machines that allow us um, to do our chemical processes. Um, we are beginning to see machines that are integrating intimately with the whole thinking about how we manage moisture, what we do at different stages in looking at that uh, fiber structure. It's quite unbelievable. Uh, what a wonderful precision product but there is no doubt that with leather being such an experiential material for the consumer, uh, that there 
is a huge artistic and craftsmanship element in the piece. And that is what makes leather such a nice material, a science and a craft um, combined uh, personalization, beautification, artistry, <coughs> working with. Leather is unique in its ability to combine comfort, practicality, and beauty, to connect with consumers in complex ways, and it has this capacity of a unique material to, to, to uh, continue to redefine itself. That's leather that I've grown up with and worked all my life, and I hope during today you get some of that beauty. Thank you very much.